Okay, we have a new Ashikai video and it is part three of three, The God of Time. So it looks like we're going to be talking about Istaroth. I did also notice the thumbnail looks like it's Nilu. Ashikai, fulfill us with your wisdom knowledge stuff. <laughs> My little scholars, tiny academic squishy little friendlies, let me get straight to the point. I I'm not tiny. Okay. I think that I may have accidentally stumbled upon the identity of Istaroth herself. I uh, actually wrote a whole theory about it before the 3.3 patch dropped and uh, then the 3.3 patch dropped with even better evidence. So uh, here's a new revamped version of my findings. I oh, guess. okay. Now, for those of you who are new, this video is the final episode of a three-part series of connected theories around forbidden knowledge, Seelies, and the God of Time. Now, yes. you do not need to watch the other two parts in order to understand this one, but it will certainly help as the previous two videos videos provide some very useful context. Links to the previous parts will be in the description The other two are very good. Definitely watch them if you haven't already. Watching. And corrections, annotations, and additional information, if any, will be in a pinned comment below. Now, Hell I don't yeah. waste anyone's time here, so travelers, please put your seat back and tray tables in their upright and locked position as our flight will be starting momentarily. Okay. The has turned on the fasten seatbelt sign in preparation for our departure, so sit back, relax, and enjoy your flight. I don't have a seatbelt. Let's start off by setting up some baselines. Istaroth is the demon name of the god of time that the people of Enkanemia know as Kairos. They call her the ruler of time and identify her as the shade of the primordial one, establishing her as one of the highest powers in all of Tevat. Yes. In the previous video, we also established the idea that the three of the primordial shades were the three moon sisters, while the fourth was likely the sun. This makes Istaroth one of the three moon sisters, as well as one of the primordial shades. I can't wait till we find now, out more about the moon sisters. Her non-demon name, Kairos, implies that she has control over a sub section of time as the Greek word kairos means perceived time as opposed to chronos which is absolute time. To put it simply, kairos is what you experience when you go, oh man that traffic light took forever to change. Well, chronos is the actual denomination of time that oh, that's passed interesting. said traffic light. So like two minutes. I didn't know that. The first okay. is how the period of time felt to you while the second is how much time actually passed. Thus far, we have seen three confirmed demonstrations of Istaroth's abilities. Wait, Two in that's really interesting. So, you know, like dreams sometimes feel like they, they last forever. That's perceived time, but usually they're only about two minutes long in reality. Most dreams, I think scientifically, are like two minutes long in, in duration and length. Uh, which is very interesting. Damn, that's pretty cool. Kanamiya and one in Inazuma. In Enkanamiya, Istaroth is credited with the creation of the Sin Shades, ghostly figures who are basically snapshots of living people's memories, more or less frozen in time. These figures are only visible during the Evernight so period, so when the Helios Barbecue isn't on. This Fine. ability is actually considered a leyline disorder, which means it's connected to the Ermansol tree, which makes sense since Ermansol is all about memories. Now, incidentally, Istaroth is also said to be responsible for teaching the sage Abrax how to build the Helios during one of his dreams. It's kind of funny how these two things overlap. Her third ability seems to be tied to Ermansol as well. Uh, yes. During a second story quest, Istaroth assisted Makoto in the creation of an Ermansol seed, which allowed the sacred Sakura to bloom in the past instead of in the present. Yeah. This altered the- Which so many people are confused about, by the way. So many people seem to think that what happened there made it happen in the present and totally ignored the whole Istaroth thing and, and treat it as fact that you can now change the past in terms of uh, just using Ermansol and not with Istaroth. Like, Istaroth is the god of time. Obviously, time can be affected by Istaroth, but uh, ain't no way yet doing shit that the Ermansol can do that shit. The entire timeline of the last 500 years of Inazuma's history. And this is very different from the memory rewrite that we've seen Nahida and Scaramouche perform with Ermansol because it didn't just alter the hearts and minds of humans, it just actually rewrote time. Like, yeah. totally Wild. changed history. Now, there is one other noteworthy mention of her in Mondstadt, of all places, specifically as the god of time that was worshipped alongside Barbados, and as the Thousand Winds of Time, a name that she later lent to the Thousand Winds Temple. Now, I won't talk yeah. too much about her relationship with Venti in this video solely because there actually isn't a whole lot available that would help flesh her out. There's a lot that will flesh Venti out, though. And now, that said, Venti does have a minor time manipulation ability, as demonstrated by his pulling of memories from the far-flung past during the Vian Laser Fest, and we also know from his character demo that he was presumably born from the branches of time, which makes it sound a bit more like a tree than wind, but whatever. Do you... Th <sighs> 
do you think the fact that Venti can show people memories and stuff is really a manipulation of time? I don't know if I do. I, I, don't, I don't think I correlate that to time personally, unless there's another explanation for it, but it's, it's, it's memories and, and like digging around in people's heads, I guess. Time manipulation makes me think you are affecting or manipulating time. I don't think that's the case, right? I don't know. It didn't go straight to time. It was more like like psychic shit. Memories from the far flung past during the Vianlaza Fest. And we also know from his character demo that he was presumably born from the branches of time, which makes it sound a bit more like a tree than wind, but whatever. Now, any mm. further investigation would turn this into a Venti video and not really an Istaroth video. And well, the point of this isn't really to investigate Venti. It's to investigate Istaroth. So... <sighs> See, I don't, I don't like that take, though. Yes, because he's pulling those memories from a period in time, not from the people themselves. But again, it's not time manipulation. Otherwise, you could say that cryovision wielders were, were hydro manipulators, because you have to have water in, in, in tandem to make ice. But they're not, it's cryo. That's what I mean. So, I, I don't know. It's probably right. I just, I, I just didn't first correlate it with time. So that's where we're going to leave that. Now, the last thing I want to mention about Istaroth before we move on to the actual theory portion of this video, mm. again, has to do with her Greek name, Kairos. In addition to the time etymology, the name is also associated with archery and weaving. Specifically, it references the moment when the shuttle passes through the loom. I mention this because the concept of weaving and time together help link Istaroth to the Mori, also known as the Greek fates. These goddesses were actually three sisters that enforced the law of the universe and the lives of mortals were represented as singular threads that the first sister would spin, the second sister would measure, and the third sister would cut. Oh. In other words, they were birth, life, and death. Now, given that Dainsliff mentions the Loom of Fate operation in regards to the Abyss Order's plans to rebel against the heavens, the connections between the three goddesses spinning out the literal fates of mankind on their spindle feels very appropriate. It feels kind of However, terrifying. if the Morai and the Moon Sisters are so aptly linked, then this implies that all three Moon Sisters, Istaroth included, had some level of control over time, or different aspects of it. For example, perceived time, absolute time, and maybe, I don't know, space time, who knows? But Istaroth being described as the measure of a thousand winds sounds similar to the second fate's role as the one who measures the lifespan of a mortal, assuming mm. the wind and the thread are interchangeable terms anyway. That said, seeing as the three Moon Sisters were said to change their posts every month, it's also possible that they rotated responsibilities and all possessed the same power, just executed them at different points in time. Now, if that's true, Ooh. then there's no reason to force Istaroth to only be connected to the element of wind, as wind is simply time, which is shared by all three sisters, who may still yet possess mastery over one or more additional elements, right? Now, this is theoretical, obviously, but I want you to understand how I'm approaching the rest of this video, which contains okay. the actual theory. This is <laughs> big brain, we're, dude. We're, we're done with the overview now. This is big brain. I'm not even into it yet. Oh, God. By reviewing the parable of the tree, which can be found in the book Before Sun and Moon, which I expect you to have read or at least be familiar with the contents of. Okay, listen. I just haven't got around to it yet, okay? But I've heard it from your video, so it's fine. Whether you have or haven't, I'm going to review the parable of the tree here because it's it provides fun. some critical context for the rest of the theory, so at least pay attention to this part. Okay. This parable is actually quite short and simple. It tells the story of a gardener who loved a tree spirit that lived inside of a tree that the king needed to cut branches from in order to build his palace. But the gardener didn't want to cut down the tree because it takes like 500 years to grow, so he went to see a priest for help. That priest happened to be an incarnation of Istaroth of all people, who gave the gardener instructions on how to clone the tree in an instant so the gardener could keep the tree while the king still gets the sacred wood that he needs to build his temple. Everybody wins. Now, there are three characters in this story. Oh. The king, the gardener, and the priest, who has already been identified as Istaroth, or at least an incarnation thereof. I actually ignored this parable for a really long time because I just didn't see what relevance it could possibly have. And then I happened to stumble upon a rather unusual myth. The Ethiopian myth of the Rook bird, as found in the Kebra Nagast. Now, the Rook bird is sometimes identified as the Rock bird. And Rook the Vata. mythological <laughs> bird, usually described as a bird of prey, like an eagle. And in the Kebra Nagast, it's this bird that is responsible for delivering a piece of sacred wood to King Solomon so that he could complete his temple. Coincidental, perhaps, but here's the thing. 
Nahida has been alluded to as a caged bird, both in visuals <sighs> and in words. She even calls herself a little bird in the Golden Apple Archipelago event. Ruka Devada, on the other hand, just reminds me a lot of a very lovely white peacock. It's mostly the dress, but still, it, bird vibes. And even if there are no bird vibes, I can't really ignore the fact that the Rook and Rook of Devada are yeah. spelled very similarly. Holyo really likes to do this kind of thing, so I'm not going to ignore it, even though it is kind of a tenuous connection. Did she maybe take wood to the Scarlet King to help build the wall? Do I remember that from somewhere or no? Am I stupid? Did Ruka Devada have nothing to do with that? Didn't Ruka Devada take wood to the Scarlet King to help build the wall in Sumeria between the desert and the, yeah, the Samia wall? Wow, that's a, that's a really good connection then. Now, both Ruka Devada and Nahida are caretakers of a sacred tree, the Ermensol, which kind of makes them both gardeners, don't you think? That's and a that really good Ruka connection. And that is symbolically both the gardener from the parable and the rook bird from the Ethiopian myth. You following me? So, if Istaroth is the priest Aww. and Ruka Devada is the gardener, then who is the king? According to the myth, the king should be King Solomon, and oddly enough, King Solomon has a lot in common with King Deshret, both mm -hmm. being kings of the desert nations who not only constructed enormous temples, but also captured jinn in bottles and sealed them with their... Well, seal. <laughs> I love how it said jinn like the alcohol did. So, if Rukadavada is the gardener and Deshret is the king, then there is only one person left who can play the role of priest Istaroth. And that is the goddess of flowers. Yes, I am actually making the claim that the goddess of flowers is Istaroth, the god of time, or at least one of the three gods of time, depending on whether or not you share my view from the first section. If you're not convinced or a little confused, that's okay. You'll understand the reasoning in due time. <laughs> I'm very skeptical, but I'm excited to see where she goes with this. Yeah, let's, we'll let her cook. <laughs> time puns. But uh, let's take a closer look at the goddess of flowers and her relation to Istaroth just to get started. The Goddess of Flowers was very close to both King Deshret and Ruka Devada, co-ruling the nation of Sumeru alongside of them, but she was significantly older than both of her friends as she witnessed and was able to remember the arrival of the Second Throne, as well as the fall of the Seelies, even going so far as to claim that she was a survivor of that disaster. The Flower of Paradise Lost says that after this disaster, the Goddess of Flowers was cast aside by heaven. Her magnificent vessel was left a savaged husk after being punished in the same way as her former kin. Her former kin, who were identified as the Seelies, were stripped of their minds, which is why they now have the form of these ghostly little husks that you see all around Tibet. Makes sense. Even then, the Goddess of Flowers continued to be described as a beautiful woman with incredible knowledge of secret things and a mastery over the power of dreams. Okay, listen, I, <laughs> I'm trying to think about this. This, it's confusing me because she's got Nilu on the screen. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, yeah, it's confusing because Nilu's on the screen. With incredible knowledge of secret things and a mastery over the power of dreams. But what I find most fascinating about the Goddess of Flowers is the story of her arrival in the desert, for that's where she landed when she was cast out of heaven. Mm. It's said that the gravel tore at the soles of her feet and she wandered the desert for 72 nights as the bloods that spilled from the wounds of her feet formed rivers, and in those rivers would blossom, quote, night blue water lilies. This descriptor should sound familiar because it matches the Nilapala lotus, aka the lunar lotus, a water lily that only blooms at night. I know we usually associate the goddess of flowers with Padisaras, but those actually came later on. It's only lilies in the early days. Now let me draw your attention to another myth that can be found in the craftable Moonpiercer Spear. The legend states that oh before God. the birth of okay, the Aranara, so there much were here, series, and there were also three sisters who would leave their pearl-colored palace to roam the desert and Nilapala lotuses would bloom at their feet. These sisters are undoubtedly the Moon Sisters, because the legend goes on to describe the death of two moons and the grief of the third sister who would never leave her palace again. And wherever the dust of the two shattered moons landed on the earth, Nilapala lotuses also bloomed. Okay. So isn't it strange that these lunar lotuses would bloom at the feet of a mere Seely survivor? Because that's not actually stated to be a thing anywhere else. And what's more, there was an entire race born from these lotuses, a Makes race sense. that considered the goddess of flowers their mistress and maybe even their mother or their queen. This race is known as the Jinn. 
The djinn are kinda curious because unlike Aranara, who are also kind of like the children of a god, they have a lot in common with a race we've already talked about, the Seelies. They're described very similarly, both being rather human in shape, but with very pale coloring, like white hair, very pale white skin, that kind of thing, right? Like Paimon. Mm -hmm. Now, notable djinn in the books like The Shepherd and the Magic Bottle are described as having little golden bells dangling from their feet and silver coins on their wrists. This description also seems to fit something like a Kothic dancer. This dance stems from India, but was heavily influenced by Persian music and choreography. It's quite unique because of its incorporation of percussive footwear in the form of bells. Ah, While the dancer connection cool. is a little bit tenuous here, it's noteworthy because Seelies were known for singing, and singing and dancing are intrinsically linked. Plus, the bells that the jinns wore might make a similar little jingling noise, like that of a floating Seelie when you chase them. But the Flower Fair Ice Loss also describes the jinn as a race that sings... So regardless of the dancer thing, the Seelies and the Jinn have this in common. Also worth noting that Lilufar, a noteworthy Jinn, has been referred to as a fairy, and Seelies are fairies. In Chinese, at least, that would be the literal translation. I, I mean, in English, too, they're also fairies. Wait, so let me get this straight. Seelies in, in direct translation is fairies? Wait, doesn't that literally delve straight back into the thoughts of, of, of Paimon being a Seelie then? Because isn't one of the... Well, I, aren't fairies in, in fairy tales and stuff usually like pranksters and stuff and always wanting to play and like have jokes and shit? Maybe that explains why... Paimon gives people nicknames all the time. Fairies uh, in folklore take away people's body parts. They're very selfish creatures. Jesus. Since a Seelie is just what you call a Welsh fairy, but I, I digress. You get the idea. Now, in the previous video, I pitched the idea that the Primordial One is basically like a biblical god, while the Four Shades yeah. are his archangels. That means that the Seelies would be angels of the lowest rank or sphere. And since we established that three of the Shades must be the Moon Sisters, that implies that the Moon Sisters were also angels. Well, archangels. But an archangel is still a type of angel, right? Mm -hmm. And if the goddess of flowers is indeed a moon sister and calls the fallen Seelie her former kin, then that would explain why the goddess of flowers was strong enough to maintain her physical form while the rest of her kin perished while still being the same type of being. She was just a higher ranked angel. Anyway, after the djinn were born from these lunar lotuses that sprung at the feet of the goddess of flowers, most of them ended up living together with the goddess of flowers in the eternal oasis. But many of them who strayed from this haven were discovered by a young king, Deshret, who studied them like a curious child and captured them in silver bottles that he would then mark with his uh, seal. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely curious where this is going to tie into Isteroth actually being... The goddess of flowers. Later on, he would meet the goddess of flowers and they would found the city of Ai Kanam, also known as the city of the moon maiden. It's an interesting name, perhaps a reference to the goddess of flowers identity? Okay, too soon. But let's set her aside for now and focus on King Deshret. Or okay. maybe I should call him King Solomon, because it's in their relationship that you start to understand why I call the goddess of flowers Istaroth. The biblical King Solomon was very, very blessed and a wise king, but he was best known for two things, I think, in modern times. The construction of the Temple of Solomon and the capturing of the jinn in jars, preventing their escape <laughs> by marking the jars with his seal. The thing is, these two things are very closely connected because Solomon essentially enslaved the jinn and coerced them into constructing his temple alongside the normal human laborers. Rude. It's funny because not only did King Deshret capture Genshin's jinn in silver bottles marked with his seal, but he also had them build portions of his mausoleum. Granted, Deshret had certainly treated the jinn way better than Solomon did. But that's understandable because in the case of Solomon, his jinn were actually demons that were kind of torturing his workers and stuff and the names of these demons you will probably be quite familiar with as they are listed in the Ars Goetia's Lesser Key of Solomon. This is probably my fault. I don't remember the part in the in the in the story. Where where did it tell us that King Deshra captured jinns in white bottles and and they tormented the workers and stuff? Was that in the Golden Slumber Quest or something? I genuinely don't remember. The Strange Towers in a book New artifacts, exploration based law. I'm getting like 50 different answers. Familiar <laughs> with as they are listed in the Ars Goetia's Lesser Key of Solomon. And they are the same names used by the current gods of Tevat Morax, Barbados, Marcosius, Avarice, Bilzebul, 
ball. You know, you get the idea. Balls? Now consider this. If the djinn considered the goddess of flowers their mistress, then that Balls. basically makes her their queen, right? And if the goddess okay. of flowers was a consort of King Deshrith, then that should make him the king of the djinn by proxy. This is fitting because his other name is Al-Amar, and that's actually the name of one of the seven djinn kings listed in the Book of Wonders. And if you dig a little deeper, you'll discover that the angel associated with Alamar is called Samuel, which should sound pretty familiar because that's the name of the wall of Samuel that separates the desert from the forest. Interesting. Right? And coincidentally, all three characters, Deshrit, Solomon, and Samuel, suffered a great folly, or a fall from grace, however you want to put it. Now, Deshrit and Samuel both participated in a rebellion against God, as per the Book of Enoch, in Samuel's case. While Solomon's fall from grace was attributed to his worship of a foreign goddess. Incidentally, Deshrit's rebellion was only made possible with the support of the goddess of flowers. And it just so happens that the goddess of flowers has a fair bit in common with the foreign goddess that Solomon worshipped. And her name was Astarte. Astarte is a Canaanite goddess of war, healing, and royalty, and she's often... I, I can't handle more new names. <laughs> We've already got so many again. Shit, oh, none of the other mythologies and stuff. Now there's another one, another name? Astarte oh, is a Canaanite goddess of war, healing, and royalty, and she's often completely interchangeable with the Akkadian goddess Ishtar and the Mesopotamian Inanna. Oh, we're not While Ishtar. While neither are moon goddesses, they are all commonly depicted with crescent moons turned upright over their heads like a pair of horns. Coincidentally, or not, the goddess of flowers is also described as a horned if Nilu's outfit, which is based on the goddess, is even remotely reliable. Oh. Even if it's not a moon reference, the horn connection still functions as Astarte was often shown riding a bull, having one pull her chariot, or in some myths, wearing bull horns to emphasize her sovereignty. Astarte is also a part of a very powerful trio of Canaanite goddesses, the other two being Anat and Asherah, potentially the other two moon sisters in this scenario. Asherah is actually very interesting because she's associated with the Tree of Life and is technically half tree herself, but that feels like a theory to tackle for another day. <laughs> yeah. Now, half in the tree. form of Ishtar, she becomes associated with the morning and evening stars, and if you watch a previous video, you'll know why that's important. But in addition to that, the symbol of this morning star is often called the Star of Ishtar, which is ironic because this yes. star is the shape that Deshrit takes in the flashbacks that we see of him. And it's also the star that we see on the chests of the Abyss Order, the Dark Serpent Knights, and on the military uniforms of the Conrian soldiers Quite like Quite a lot Captain. of places. Food for thought. And later in history, Astarte's name became the foundation for the demon that's found in the Lesser Key of Solomon, who worshipped Astarte, that became known as Astaroth, who is also the basis for the name Istaroth. And let me just take this one step further. We've already established that the Primordial One is a Biblical God, the Seelies are angels, the Moon Sisters are shades of the Primordial One, and the shades are therefore Archangels, right? Have we? <laughs> Now, while there can be up to 10 named archangels in the biblical canon, four are particularly noteworthy. Those four are Michael, Raphael, Gabriel, and Uriel. And it just so happens that Uriel goes by another name, Israel. Are you following me? No. No. <laughs> and it's not your fault. There's just so fucking much information. Goes by another name, Israel. Are you following me? Astarte is Astaroth, Istrael is Istaroth. Yes? No? Okay, so let me get this straight. Let me get this straight. Astarte is Astaroth, Istrael is Istaroth, Paimon is Paimon, Ether is Lucifer, uh, the, 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 the Scarlet King is, is Solomon, the Goddess of Flowers is Istaroth, also Nilu. The... What? <laughs> Also just Ishtar. I guess I could have just gone with that. Ah. But wait, hold up. You're probably wondering why I'm using these demon and angel names interchangeably. Yeah. And that would be because angels and demons are essentially the same type of entity. And you know, I got to say, though, now I understand. I always see Ashikai uh, posting tweets out saying, like, stressing about writing the scripts and stuff. I can completely fucking understand why. Because all of this stuff does make sense. It does, even though it doesn't seem like it does on the surface, for sure. It does make sense. It's just a lot of information and you 
you probably need to watch it slower and multiple times to make it make sense. Because there's no way I could listen to all this at once and make it make sense in my own head, for sure. In fact, traditionally, most demons are either fallen angels or descendants of fallen angels. But again, another theory for another time. But this realization is important mm. because it means that Istaroth is a demon name and Uriel is an angel name or Israel is an angel name. The demon name is there because she was cast out of heaven and is therefore a fallen angel. And if you're not convinced of the whole archangel thing, let me throw you something else. Oh, you another bone? You remember how I said Istaroth is also called the Thousand Winds and that I kind of wanted to push the idea that there may be other elements involved here? Well, I would like to propose that she also has the power over water. See, the goddess of flowers has far more water associations than wind associations. Rivers sprung from her feet, her domain was an eternal oasis, and water flowed from her sleeves, and she's also the god of prophecy. Which is why I am so curious if this ends up being true, how this correlation even happened. Because I'm going to be honest, even now, maybe this part will change my opinion, but I don't think Hysteroth is the goddess of flowers. I still don't. Uh, I, th I think they're two totally separate entities, but I'm happy to be proven wrong because this is a very interesting theory. And if the connection between prophecy and water confuses you, then let me reintroduce you to our pal, Mona, who interestingly enough, displays a star of- But didn't Mona study hydromancy? Yeah, she's also a hydro character and has no uh, ties to the wind. <laughs> introduce you to our pal, Mona, who interestingly enough, displays a star of Ishtar and a crescent moon in her charged attack. Weird. Oh, that's interesting. Anyway, Mona practices no, hydromancy, that. a form of fortune telling that relies on the stars. This works by a complex process of combining the reflections of water with that of her scry glass. She interprets these reflections and turns them into prophecies of fate. Which is funny, seeing as I started this video by connecting the three moon sisters to the Greek fates. What do you think? Mm. Now you can always see Mona's scryglass in her idol animations, but during Unreconciled Stars, we actually got to solve a puzzle that utilized the large version of this same scryglass. And the best part about this is that the Latin characters can now be translated using this common key that I swiped from the wiki. <laughs> the text in the middle of the scryglass translates into something like, from the height of the light in the light of the great God that he poureth out the elements in the minds of. What? Sounds a bit like a spell or maybe a prayer. It's not that important beyond establishing the concept of a singular god rather than Genshin's polytheistic gods. If only you had Mona, it's okay, you wouldn't be able to see this anyway. If only we had replayable events with really important lore in them. Perhaps it's a reference to the Primordial One being a god of light. The inner ring is much simpler. It's just four letters that translate directly into N S E W, which North, is south, quite east, obviously west. referring to the cardinal directions. This may interest those of you who watched the first video in this series where we connected the Hexen Circle, of which Mona is a member, to the Adventurers Guild, which uses a compass rose as its logo. But this also has a deeper meaning now. But to understand it, we need to be able to translate the outermost ring, which mostly reads like gibberish. It's like BLE world a medical cable. It actually means um Biluk, Liluk, Aluk, Reluk, Liluk, Miluk, Hiluk, Death. I, I, and, I no, that's not a cipher, trust me, it's just random letters. Or is it? If you start at the letter G, you might notice that there are four <laughs> groups of three letters. They are G B L. Green, blue, lello. URL. That's what there is on the internet. MKL. Mouse, keyboard, l l light. And RPL. They all end in L. Role play light. And if you've been paying attention, you should immediately recognize these as the names of the archangels. Oh, for fuck's sake. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. That's the first thing that I recognized when we see these b bunches of three. Are you kidding me, Ashigoy? And if you've been paying attention, you should immediately recognize these as the names of the archangels, abbreviated. Ain't no GBL shot. GBL for Gabriel, URL for Uriel, MKL for Michael, and RPL for Raphael. And these four archangels specifically are referred to as the angels of the four directions, archangels. Okay. What the fuck? <laughs> That's actually fucking cool as shit. Holy fuck.
Uh, but but I'm gonna debunk this right now because if we start from uh, uh, B, then it's B L U, which obviously means blue. Uh, and then it's RLM, which obviously means red with a bit of lime. Then it's KLR, which is color with a K, just to spice it up a bit. And then PLG for pig Latin guinea pigs. Specifically are I referred to as the angels of the four directions in Christian theology. So now the innermost ring makes sense being the four cardinal directions. Nothing about this makes sense, and that's why I love it. There's even a more common- I'm lying. It, it, okay, my it, my, it, my, 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 it makes too much sense, which is why I love it. It makes that much sense that it doesn't make sense. Bedtime prayer that solidifies this connection, and it goes something like this. To my right, Michael, and to my left, Gabriel. In front of me, Uriel, and behind me, Raphael. And over my head, God's presence through his Holy Spirit. Now, listen, I am not actually suggesting that the Hexen Circle is a group of lunar goddess worshipping witches running a worldwide guild for some unknown purpose or anything, but don't you think it's a little interesting that one of their primary forms of divination appears to be connected to the goddess of flowers? It seems to me that divination, or knowledge of a future time, is a reasonable ability for the god of time to possess, don't you? Okay, so basically this whole theory boils down- Okay, I do want to say this though. I feel like those last few points were really fucking cool, but I don't... And again, I might just need to rewatch it. They were really cool points, but more so about Mona and not so much about Isteroth and the Goddess of Flowers, right? Because I, I don't see what that would mean for Isteroth and the Goddess of Flowers. Um, yeah, the TLDR. We'll listen to this first. Down to this. Ruka Devada is the rook bird that delivered sacred wood or ermansel branches to King Deshret, who is likened to King Solomon. Both yeah. kings ruled over the jinn and had them assist in the construction of their temples. King Deshret was infatuated with the goddess of flowers, who has a lot in common with the goddess Astarte, who King Solomon worshipped, and both goddesses led to the downfall of their respective kings. Astarte is basically synonymous with Ishtar, and the combination of these two names form the basis of the name Astaroth or Istaroth, who we know of as the god of time. The goddess of flower also has traits in common with the moon sisters via the Neilapala lotuses and the birth of the jinn, who strongly resemble the Seelies of which the moon sisters and the goddess of flowers claim kinship with. Mm. Celes and the Moon Sisters appear to be based on angels and archangels respectively, the latter specifically being Uriel or Israel, Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel, although one of these is not a Moon Sister but instead the Sun, which could be Fanes, just saying. The Moon Sisters also share traits with the Morai, also known as the Greek Fates, which means that it's possible that all three sisters are gods of time, and not just Istaroth. In addition, the art of divination to determine someone's fate is attributed to the Hexen Circle, implying that the Hexen Circle has connections to the Moon Sisters, especially since Mona's Scryglass seems to identify them by name. And that is why I think the Goddess of Flowers is Istaroth. And this is also where I originally planned to launch into a long discussion about Enochian literature and how it connects to forbidden knowledge, the fall of angels, and to that's current predicament, but uh, in light of several new revelations brought about by the lore in patch 3.3, this section is going to be its own video, so uh, stay tuned for the finale of this three-part, but actually four-part series where we tie up all the loose ends from these last three parts. Those loose ends? Real this time. Anyway, I am actually going to wrap things up here. I am very tired and not clever enough to come up with a funny send off today. So I'm just going to give a quick shout out to every single one of my channel members who helped make today's video possible. And another very special thanks to you, dear viewer, who actually made Thank it you. to the end of this video. I am impressed. You are a rare breed. And so am I, probably, since I am also still here, but <laughs> not for long. I need a snack, so I'm going to go. Take care, guys. Thank you for watching, and I will catch you all in the finale. Bye for now. Hell yeah. Bye for now, Ashikai, you legend. Uh, chat, definitely go check that out. Definitely go check that out. That was an insane video, dude. That was insane. It was a really well put together one. Someone did say the part where you decoded the scry glass literally made my jaw drop. That was a lot. That part was a lot to take in. Someone said, went from a simple tale to an advanced level college history class spanning several religions and ideals. I like it. <laughs> yeah, that's also very true. Holy shit. If your first thought when you see a theory is like, that's a stretch, I don't know. Like, it's, of course it's a stretch. It's a theory. You're not going to hear a theory and think that's going to be 100% accurate. Otherwise, it, it'd be pointless for it to be a theory. Don't have to take everything as a fact. It's just a fun thing.